All right, I think we're ready to get started. Ready to go? Okay, fantastic. So welcome everyone to a wonderful Friday, 8.30 a.m. presentation on a deeply technical topic. We're all excited to be here, right? Yes? <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the subject of this talk is Fuchsia, uh, which of course is a, an operating system that's been under development for a few years now by Google. And uh, probably the most important thing I need to point out at the very bottom of the slide is, is that Google is in no way involved with this talk. This talk is not trying to signal anything like that. This is a technical talk just for the sake of doing a technical talk about an interesting technical subject. That's all this is. Okay, so, uh, you know, why have a talk about Fuchsia just for the purposes of talking about um, a, a new operating system? And really the point that I'm, I'm most trying to accomplish here is to sort of dive into the depths of what is the Fuchsia kernel, which is called Zircon, and kind of be able to give you some data points as far as what's there, what's missing, and give you just kind of a sense of what the operating system seems to be about based on the source code and the documentation that's publicly available. Um, the prior picture here, I should say this picture right here, this is a um, wind cave if you're ever in South Dakota, a fun place to go in, um, and it's uh, very light splunking because they have paths everywhere, so it's all easy to go. So. You know, again, just be super, super clear. There's no agenda here. We're just exploring. Um, that's a wonderful picture of box work, which is in Wind Cave, and almost all the box work in the world and uh, world's caves is actually located in Wind Cave. So I'm going to not talk about caves now. <laughs> okay, so uh, overall, three things that we're going to look at um, in the time that we have is let's take a look at what is it, uh, let's look at design, a little bit of code, um, how things kind of work from an interface perspective, how things work from a design perspective. Uh, device driver perspective, how do they boot the system, you know, some of those things. And then last, I've got some kind of usage basic stuff of, you know, if you want to get it running on your laptop or on your own arm board, you can do it and how to, how to basically do that. It's not too difficult. Okay, so, um, what is Fuchsia? So, Google describes it in the documentation as a modular capability based operating system. And we'll find that in the source code there are some things that are surfaced that kind of give weight to that description. And uh, I'll, I'll point that out here in some, some slides that are coming up. Um, as far as the componentry of the system, one of the things that we're going to spend most of the, the time of this talk about is talking about Zircon, which is the kernel. Then there are things that kind of go out from outside of that kernel which are unique. So they have a, what's called a Zircon core. They have frameworks. They have their networking, their graphics, and things like that, and so we'll, we'll kind of lightly touch on, on some of those things. But all in all, what Fuchsia is, it's a new operating system, and it's a very kind of different, unique operating system in, in some respects, but in other ways, it's just like any other operating system that, that you've seen before. You know, memory management, it's not mysterious. Locks, again, you know, really nothing innovative there that I would necessarily uh, like to call out, at least for this audience. So, you know, I think when people approach Fuchsia and the, they think about it is, you know, back in, when Linux got started, it was very easy to say, well, you know, the thing that Linux is trying to do is follow in on the Unix tradition. And, you know, it was basically, it was a desktop x86 um, Unix operating system. And of course, it flowered from there and went across many different architectures and such. Fuchsia, Fuchsia hasn't really answered this question as far as, you know, what's its sweet spot? What's it really trying to do? And I know there's a lot of people that go and, and uh, sort of wax poetic about that, but, you know, I'm really trying to ignore that. Okay, so we have to dive back and have just a little bit of a history lesson as far as Zircon is concerned, which is, of course, the, the kernel, as I mentioned prior. So Zircon actually started as a branch of Little Kernel, or LK. Um, and the two, you know, have kind of uh, two distinct uh, branches in life that they've gone down. So LK has been used in, you know, Android's trusty, um, in the Android bootloader and stuff like that. So, you know, we'll just kind of acknowledge that. But Zircon is different in so much that it's 64-bit only. There's, there's no 32-bit support at all, whereas Little Kernel has that. Um, Zircon has a user mode, you know, it does a lot of things that sort of scale up to be a, a modular operating system. Little kernel, uh, not so much. Um, 
And Zircon has this concept of a capability-based security, which, you know, again, we're going to get into that in just a minute. Um, okay, so if you go back in time and you uh, look at uh, seminal books, you know, there's the Bach book, which of course tries to come up with this ring system of describing what Unix is. Um, we can kind of do the same thing for, for Zircon, and uh, please forgive the, uh, the very basic graphic here, but more or less I guess what I'm trying to say is, is at the very center, of course, we have a kernel, um, we have the core, we have frameworks, and then on the outside we have um, our device drivers and graphic stacks and all that kind of good stuff. Now, from an EL perspective, which is also what I'm trying to portray in this picture, is that the only thing in the very middle is what's running in like an EL1 or an EL2. Everything else is, is trying to be user space. Um, so that means device drivers are up in user space, the networking stack, um, services, all that kind of good stuff. And the things that are in gray, those frameworks, they're supposed to support both the kernel as well as user space services. So they, they've done some things in their source code to kind of try to make that happen. And their source code is in C++, so they, they've had to be uh, kind of fairly careful with things and we'll see that in just a minute. Okay, so what's another kind of way of taking a look at a, a kernel? Well, let's, let's approach things from the syscall interface. How does Zircon do it? Um, so of course, syscalls, as we all know, um, it's all about um, you know, user space interacting with the system, uh, with the kernel itself. Um, as far as Zircon is concerned, their syscalls are generally non-blocking. You know, they have uh, roughly three, t three categories of, of syscalls. So the first one is, you know, calls that have really no limitations. You're just going out and accessing a clock or something like that. So, so you don't get a piece of data, return it right back. Um, the second kind of call that they have, or the second kind of category, is where they have a handle um, that's being passed in. And so Zircon has this idea of there are kernel objects that are within the kernel, and you have a handle to those kernel objects. And so we'll, we'll see a little bit about how that architecture is put together in a few minutes in a few moments. And then the last category is as well, in order to get a handle or create a kernel object on the other side or inside of the kernel through the syscall layer, you know, you have to be able to say, all right, I need to create a new, new object, please return it to me and give me a handle to that thing so I can keep interacting with it in, as, uh, through the lifetime of the application or system service or what have you. So how do they surface their entire user space? Well, this is the thing that's kind of interesting because if you remember, um, not so many years ago in Linux, we had this thing called klibc. Um, so this is kind of a little bit like that. So what they've done is, is they have this libzircon shared library. It's a, it's a VDSO, and they have the entire syscall ABI within that shared library. So as a user space entity, when you're trying to do a syscall, you're gonna do it to that, that uh, VDSO. Okay, so I had mentioned uh, a little bit about handles. And so, of course, these are user space references to kernel objects. And you can, of course, have a kernel object that has multiple handles pointing to it. So one process over here might have a handle, another process over here might have a handle that that exact same object. Um, when the last handle is closed, you know, the kernel object is effectively gonna go away. Um, and so if there's any finalization or anything like that, clean up, what have you, that's, that's when that's gonna get done. Now, handles can get passed around between processes. You can actually push a handle through a, a communications channel, um, so it's kind of like IPC. Um, a handle has a concept of rights. So what and how you can interact with the ob kernel object that is represented by the handle is contained within the rights um, that are associated with that handle. So two completely different handles to the same kernel object might have different rights associated with, or might have different rights as far as what you can do with that particular kernel object. Um, the, of course, the actions that you can take against that particular handle, you know, they're governed by the, by the rights, um, so kind of no, no surprise there. Okay. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about kernel objects and, uh, you know, and, and kind of tie the, the handle concept um, together a little bit better at the point. So what they do is they have this, con this idea of a kernel object ID. 
and it's a 64-bit unsigned integer. Um, they are meant to be unique, and they don't get reused. And then there's one bit which is sort of held aside so that you can create sort of fake uh, handles or to a, to a fake um, object in the kernel if you, if you feel the need to do that. So you really have a 63-bit um, address space as far as the kernel objects are concerned. Now, how these, ha these um, numeric values are actually generated, there doesn't seem to be any rules in the source code as far as how they do that, and actually in the documentation they kind of come out and say, well, we, you know, we don't impose a particular policy. Um, stepping back and maybe you know, reflecting on this a little bit, this does worry, you know, make me worry about, okay, could you get into a situation where you run out of these values? What happens then? <laughs> Well, um, as it says in the documentation, basically the only way that you can kind of re, you know, get back to a, a known state with more, or I should say reset the values that are available for the, the, uh, these handles, is you gotta reboot the system. And so it seems like an interesting design choice or maybe something that they're gonna come back and revisit. So they've got something roughed in and this is how it works for now and maybe they're gonna come back. But this is all conjecture, so it's hard to, you know, hard to say exactly. Another thing that kind of has popped into my mind as I'm looking at the source code, and I haven't come down to uh, uh, how they do handle it, is, well, could you just put in a bogus value and get lucky and then have some addressability to a, a different kernel object in the system? Seems like uh, that might be a bit of a security hole or a security concern. And so I think, you know, there's probably an answer in the source there were documentation somewhere, I just haven't run across it yet, so I'm sure they've gotta have something, at least I sure hope they do. Okay, so let's talk about threads and processes and jobs and all that kind of good stuff and sort of how is this all stacked together. Um, so in the very, uh, very inside of the, uh, the concept is a thread, and so a thread is a, a unit of execution. It has stacks, it has registers, and all those kinds of things as, as, you'd, be, uh, as you'd expect, just as how Linux does it. Then a process, um, it has a defined address space. So this includes, of course, the shared libraries that the application is dealing with it, or the memory that's been allocated by the application, all that kind of good stuff. And then lastly, there's the job, concept of a job. And so the process fits inside of the job, the thread fits inside of the process, you have multiple threads, all that kind of good stuff as you'd expect. So you know, nothing really new or, or different, all that here. And then, of course, jobs have resource limits, so you know, that uh, kind of keeps your job from taking over the entire, or your process, or your thread taking over the entire system. Okay, uh, let's talk about a few other kernel features that are within uh, the Zircon kernel. So they have a concept of sockets um, and channels, and they're really kind of two, um, two variations on the same thing, which is you're gonna pass data around from point A to point B, um, between processes, so a socket is a stream, um, and channels are datagram. Um, so pretty simple stuff. Uh, of course, we have signals. Um, you know, nothing, uh, nothing too surprising there. Um, and then they have a concept of events, and there's also something called event pairs. So uh, event is a, is a receiver of signals, and event pairs are events that might stack on top of each other. Um, so um, you know, if you close a ch um, one side of a channel, that means you're gonna wanna close the other side of the channel, so you have one event that kinda triggers the other. Um, we have virtual memory objects, which of course are associated with, um, with the process, as I mentioned on the prior page. So of course that represents the pages, which are the physical pages that are allocated, or, you know, just like Linux, the potential pages that aren't yet um, carved out, but could be potentially there once you touch them. And so, you know, you have the usual set of APIs that you'd expect for, for dealing and cr creating those kinds of memories. Um, just like Linux, we have Futexes and Zircon, so nothing, uh, nothing too special there, just the, the kinds of things that you'd expect. So all the sync primitives and such, they've, uh, they've made sure to, uh, to cover that. Okay, now, this takes a, a little bit of explaining, is that unlike our good old Linux kernel, Zircon is in C++. Um, this might cause some of you to hiss or boo. 
Uh, maybe not, maybe you're fans of C++, but it, it's certainly an interesting design decision in so much that they didn't go whole hog into C++ and all the things that C++ could do. They tossed out a whole bunch of things. Um, so I don't want to that, say that they're just using C++ as C with classes. They do take advantage of, of um, you know, some of the, the what would be like the standard template library, but they've gone and re-implemented it themselves such that it can serve both user space as well as inside of the kernel. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of stuff that they just say, nope, don't do it, you know, like runtime, you know, type indications, you can't do operator overloading, don't do virtual, virtualization, all that kind of good stuff. So they have their own set of rules that, that thankfully they've documented, and then as far as class libraries that you're allowed to use, those are in something called the FBL. Um, and so, you know, stacks and queues and things like that. Um, so it's really meant to be a basic set of stuff, but it's not fully like the, uh, the standard template library either. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about writes. And so I mentioned prior that this is supposed to be a, you know, kind of a capability-based operating system, and how do they manage writes and all those things? Well, as we were talking about handles earlier, it is associated with handles. And so within the handle itself, there is a data structure that's associated inside of the kernel object that specifies what writes do you actually have when it comes to that particular handle. And again, it's, uh, it's really a pretty straightforward kind of system and you know, as you, if you wanna go and, and, and see exactly for your own well, edification, um, I've got a direct link into the exact H file that'll take you to the entire complete list, but it's, you know, do I have the right to read? Do I have the right to execute? Do I have the right to write something? You know, it, it's really all the kind of standard set of stuff that you'd expect. Now, when you copy a handle, it isn't necessarily the same rights that I have are gonna be the same rights that are gonna get passed on to the person that receives the copy. So you can get into situations where it will narrow down those rights. So for instance, when you pass a handle through a channel to another process, there are some things which it'll naturally do, say, oh, I'm gonna revoke some of these rights and then make that process re-request um, some of the capabilities that might have been granted. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how do they boot user space on Zircon, because it's a little unique. Um, so, no surprise, they have to make an image and you have to get that memory into user space. So, of course, the, you know, that implies that the kernel, of course, gets loaded. But then what they also do is they graft onto the kernel the first user space process that's gonna run. And so that thing is called user boot. Now user boot is an ELF binary, and so they call it an RODSO, or read-only uh, dynamically shared object. And it's a very straightforward kind of entity in so much that it just has PT load segments. So it's just basically you jam it into memory and you can instantly branch to it and start running. Um, and so because it's built into the kernel at compile time, you know, everything is known as far as where stuff actually is in, in memory. So, you know, no surprise, when you're starting to boot user space, kernel maps in user boot, um, and it maps in the VDSO, which of course has the syscall library, and since we know where user boot is as far as its memory location is concerned, we can just directly branch into it. Um, then what happens after user boot starts running, then what it does is it has its own ELF program loader in it. And so what it will do then is, is it will start up the system and depending on how you configured it, it may be the last process when you're rebooting or you can it can delegate and say, okay, there's something that's more complicated and it's a better last process, if you will, than, than it is and it will, will delegate that over to somebody else. So um, kind of a, again, another sort of interesting design choice that they made. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about device drivers. Um, so device drivers in this environment are all shared libraries. They're all user space entities, and so there's a, a service that's up in user space called dev host, which is ultimately gonna be the thing that loads in the device driver. Now let's step back for a minute and talk and think about the device driver user you know, landscape when you're building a new operating system. This is not GPL compatible. I, you can't take stuff out of the Linux kernel and port it to Fuchsia. 
Uh, you can from like NetBSD, and actually within the source code there's a few NetBSD drivers where they basically took a shim, grafted that on top of what NetBSD has, but then of course it's doing it the, the future way. So it's it, you know, sort of interesting, um, and it's a challenge for a new operating system because obviously if you want to run on lots of hardware, you start needing device drivers. You know, do you really want to present the challenge of making everybody recreate a whole vast you know, ocean of device drivers. That's, a, that's an interesting problem to have to go and solve. Okay, so anyway, um, Dev Manager as the system service that deals with uh, device drivers, it's tracking the drivers and it's tracking the devices. So it's ultimately doing that matching between, okay, I have a thing, it's a real physical entity, how do I map that into the right device driver and then let that device driver take over and, and bind to that, that device. So there's a, uh, basically it's a, a four call API for you know, editing the device driver, so it's just basically get the driver into memory, let it do all of its general um, global opt initialization and whatever it needs to do. Then you bind it to a physical thing, which is actually then telling the device driver, okay, you know, here's your hardware that you know how to run, you know, go off, get that going, and then um, create is um, more of a platform framework kind of concept that doesn't really get used very much in, in drivers. Now, the la that brings me to the last um, API call when it comes to device drivers, which is release. So, you know, we've kind of, I've kind of mentioned that device drivers are up in user space, so in theory we should have this siren song or capability of being able to reboot our device drivers because they're up in user space, right? And we should be able to unload them and, and do some, you know, dynamic things with them. Turns out that's not implemented yet. Um, so that's a problem they're going to have to figure out and solve some way somehow. But at, you know, at this point, as far as what's in the documentation, what seems to be in the source code, you know, not done, not practiced. You know, more work to be done here. Okay. Um, so when a device driver binds, they have sort of a, a unique um, kind of way that they identify the device driver to the class of driver as well as the subclass as well as the interfaces that things are, are provided. So I threw a little bit of code up here where it's um, pulling up the, uh, the H AHCI driver and kind of how, how the driver basically introduces itself to the system and say here's this kind of sets of stuff that, that I go off and do. And you know as is the case with many device drivers there's lots of magic numbers in there and this one's no different. You know it's all kind of lots of hard code so you know it may be a new operating system, but they really aren't doing anything unique or different that you probably haven't seen elsewhere in other operating systems. Okay, so let's get into getting started with Fuchsia. We've got about two minutes left, so we'll have to breeze through these. Source code's all fully available. Um, uh, the, this curl command up here, that's how you get started. So that'll pull everything down and get it onto your local machine. Um, you know, none of this stuff is, is behind a wall, you don't have to sign up for anything, it's just kind of there, so it's really easy to get started. Um, they use a tool called Jiri, uh, I think that's the right pronunciation. It's a lot like repo in Android, if any of you have ever worked with the Android source base. Um, there are two commands that you use to uh, kind of see what sort of boards that they're um, that they support as well as what they call products. And so what a product is is a lot like a Linux distribution concept where how much of all the packages within Fuchsia are you actually gonna go and build? Are you just gonna build a minimum amount? Are you gonna build something that's a little bit more capable? Or are you gonna build the entire world? So building the entire world is right now workstation. If you wanna build something that doesn't have any graphics whatsoever, that's terminal. Um, speaker, of course, would be something more of an embedded device. Same thing as router, and then there's core and bring up if you're of course, bringing, if you're bringing up on something new. As far as the boards that are there, um, we see some old friends, you know, like HiKey 960, QMU, uh, the MSN 8X, um, same thing with the MediaTek, you know, so it's, it is, um, you know, from an ARM perspective, it's very, uh, you know, kind of very cut down, very minimalistic. The x86 environment, however, is the only one that has a graphics stack. The ARM environment does not. And that, of course, is, is purely down to the, uh, the state of affairs when it comes to device drivers. Um, so anyways, FX build, FF, FX run, and away you go, and that'll, that'll get you going within QMU. 
Um, the community is very open. They have an IRC channel. They do tend to be pretty chatty. The docs are out there on fuchsia.dev now. So again, every, you know, it's pretty easy to get up to speed and get going and being productive in the environment. And you know, they take code submissions via Garrett. So um, you do have to do, sign the Google CLA to submit code. But you know, again, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so last slide as we down to uh, 17 seconds. You know, Fuchsia is still under rapid development. It you know, seemed to be doing its really very best to follow an open source development model, although you know, certainly it seems to be largely Googlers that are working on it, but they do welcome external submissions. Um, I've thrown code at them and you know, they were happy to take it. They've got a great website. Um, you know, it's an interesting, worthwhile project if you're into experimenting with operating systems. And so in that way, I'll close things out with the, again, Google was not responsible or in any way involved with this presentation. So thank you very much.